Okay, welcome back. Oh. Okay, welcome back. This is part two of chapter 19. Um, so you can tell we're in for a bumpy ride here. Um, let's see. Well, I'll go back to the slide before. I know you want to look at that urinal a little bit longer. So we're starting off by looking at reactions to the horrors of World War I. Um, the war started in 1914 and ended in 1918, um, and it was horrific. I don't know if you've studied this in any of your other classes, but it was um, sort of first, first modern warfare that really involved a lot of inhumanity and a lot of horrors um, and a lot of uh, shell shock or PTSD. Um, and the artist who started off the, the century being extremely optimistic about what the 20th century would hold were shocked by the horrors that came with that war. And they realized that uh, humans really could not be constructive. They could not be progressive, that there was something innate in their nature that made them just... Um, want to kill each other. I guess that's it. <clears throat> so um, our first movement that reacts to World War I is Dada. And it begins with the opening of the Cabaret Voltaire in 1916. The Dada movement mocked the senselessness of rational thought. Basically, if rational thought brings us to this horrible place, um, then What's the point of rational thought? So um, there's a whole group of people that jo joined the Dada movement, and Dada just was a nonsense word that they just picked almost out of the air um, to say, yeah, well, why have a why have a really good title when everything is meaningless? So um, Hugo Ball's performance of reciting the sound poem Karawane reflects the spirit of the cabaret. He recited the nonsense sound poem solemnly while covered in cardboard. So um, here's Hugo Ball. Um, there in that little box is the nonsense poem of Karawane. This was photographed at the Cabaret Voltaire in 1916 in Zurich, Switzerland. He's got little lobster claws on his hand. Um, so I hope you get that. So Dada persistently presented staggering challenges to artistic conventions using irrationality, chance, and humor. Optimism died. I have lots of little notes on this. And here we go. Um, this is Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. So uh, Dada spread this idea, this sort of uh, radical abandonment of any purpose, really. It spread from Zurich to New York to Barcelona, Berlin, Cologne, and Paris. So the uh, Western world was dominated by, or infected, I should say, by Dada. Um, Marcel Duchamp created ready-mades that appealed to the mind rather than the senses. In Fountain, which you see here, it was a porcel porcelain urinal. He just turned it 90 degrees, so instead of standing it upright, he just sort of laid it down on a, a table um, and signed under a pseudonym. So it says Armut, but that is not his name. His name is Marcel Duchamp. Um, and it was the most famous of all the pieces that he made, of all of his ready-mades. It sparked controversy as to whether a, appropriated art, meaning art that the artist doesn't actually create but finds and elevates, um, whether appropriated art was acceptable art. Duchamp argued that the artness of art lies in the artist's choice of the article. So in a sense... He's inventing conceptual art, saying it's not the object, it was the idea that makes it art. And then, of course, you can argue about whether there's any idea here or not. Um, 
freed to do that. Before this, Duchamp was actually a pretty good um, post-Cubist painter. So he did some, um, some very notable paintings, which you would see if you took an uh, art history survey course. But that, we don't have time for that. So I'm going to show you some more um, Dada. So Hannah Huch is a woman Dadaist who um, takes Picasso's idea of collage, of attaching... Uh, printed images onto her canvas and makes many collages because again you know why should I bother to paint something or to craft something when it's all meaningless anyway so um, this is uh, she concentrated on pointed political commentary through collage Cut with the Dada knife through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch in Germany here, uh, shows women physically cutting apart the German establishment through images and text from the popular press. And you can see many, many uh, repeats of the word Dada, so I can only assume that she actually cut those out of newspaper stories that were about Dada artists. Um, it's kind of chaotic, I would say, um, so you can just look at how messy it is. It's kind of hard to pick anything out of there to understand what what's really happening. But another Dada artist here, I like just like to include this. It's by um, an artist, Herzfeld. Um, and he did collage too, but he brought together um, pieces to create a scene. So he synthesized a scene. Um, and here we have Hitler with a couple of knives and a chicken with a very strange head. I think he's got a hood on over his uh, head. And he's, um, the, the caption says, don't worry, he's a vegetarian. So, um, so here's our little chart. I've put these in periodically so you don't get too lost with all of the, um, the isms. Expressionism, Cubism, Futurism, and finally Dada. But now we're done with Dada. And we're going to jump back in time. So look at the date on this. This is 1903. This is before Picasso's Le Demoiselle. But we're jumping back to just see what the heck has been going on in America and the United States. So um, we have Alfred Stieglitz, who's a photographer. And uh, he did this photograph of the Flatiron Building in New York. But what he's attempting to do here is to use photography in a fine art way, um, not as a representation of the Flatiron Building. It happens to be there. But what he's doing is composing a, a pleasant or beautiful composition using the form of the Flatiron Building, the tree, the white ground, uh, snow-covered ground in the bottom. So if you just look at it as sort of an abstraction, then you can get that, what it was about. So um, Alfred Stiglitz is also notable because he um, was excited by all of this modern art that was happening in Europe, all of the expressionism and everything. So he brought an exhibit of this new European avant-garde art to New York City, and they uh, created, they put up this great exhibit called the Armory Show, which is um, legendary, and um, showed it to New Yorkers, to the New York art scene, and to anybody who came, and it created quite a stir on this side of the ocean. So, um, so the stuff that I've been showing you is like the stuff that came in the Armory show, or the earlier stuff, for sure. Here's another American. This is Marsden Hartley. This is also considered kind of um, influenced by, by Cubism. I just find it a, a very peculiar piece to fit into any flow that we've been looking at. Uh, you can see it's some recognizable things. It looks to me like everything has been colored with oil pastels on a black background. Uh, and there's some recognizable pieces, several country flags like this uh, blue and white uh, harlequin 
pattern down here is um, the flag of Bavaria and the German cross up here, um, red cross down there, several bottles there. So this is, uh, he did lots of paintings like this, and this is a portrait of a German officer. He was, like I said, he was an American, but he spent his um, life and his uh, career was in Germany. Um, his style is called Cosmic Cubism, uh, and he was influenced by Synthetic Cubism. He was, he was gay, and his um, lover was a German officer who was killed in, I believe, killed in Germany, World War I, maybe. Um, and this is his elegy to him. Now, I, I really like this one. So George O'Keefe is another American artist, and she's uh, considered by many people to be the most famous American woman painter of the 20th century. And um, here's what she abstracted from a city cityscape. Um, it's called City Night, 1926. I really like this because it uses forms or the idea of skyscrapers, but not literally. Like it kind of takes the forms and creates this um, scene or composition where the forms are just kind of lo looming overhead and perhaps the moon down below. So it's very abstract um, and I think pretty cool. I'm going to see if I have any more notes about this. Um, City Night marks O'Keeffe's shift to painting New York skyscrapers. It's a celebration of lofty buildings portrayed from a low vantage point. No human is present. The viewer is dwarfed by the city. Here she tried to capture the sensibility of the machine age, similar reduction seen in flower pieces. So um, this is what was in the textbook, but this is what she's best known for. She did lots of series of flowers, of really enlarged flowers. Um, and she lived out in New Mexico for a while and painted many, many scenes of the desert. So that's Georgia O'Keeffe. Now let's go back to Europe, and we have this artist, El Lizitsky. Um, This represents what's going on in Europe between the wars. So we've already seen a reaction against civilization, this reaction to World War I. Um, so many artists and architects responded to the destruction and loss of a generation of young men by criticizing European traditions, while others focused on rebuilding, saying, no, we've got to pull ourselves back, um, back on track. In Russia, artists were committed to leaving the studio and going into factories where the real body of life is made. And there are quotes around that, so somebody else said that. Um, the engineer, El Lizitsky, used Majevich's formal vocabulary. Majevich was the guy who did the, the red rectangles. So he used that formal vocabulary to create uh, these installations. They're, he called them prunes, uh, some of which were early examples of installation art. So here's the invention of installation. Um, it's a room, and he just put these machine-made forms on the wall, composing them in a way that he felt was aesthetically pleasing. Um, I'm just the reporter, but I think it's interesting now. You've seen the invention of collage and the invent invention of installations today. So, in the Netherlands, let's look at de style. Piet Mondrian led the de style movement, which addressed two kinds of beauty, sensual and rational. He worked in the rational beauty, so he really thought that and I've shown you several paintings which were appealing to sensual beauty. They just wanted you to look at, at this and to feel it and to feel the beauty of it. Um, but he wanted his beauty to be rational, to be more intellectual. The goal was to create an aesthetic that was rational and perfect and could bring peace and stability to the world, achieving universal harmony. So there... Um, is a self-portrait of Mondrian, and on the left is one of his early paintings of a tree, where you can see he's kind of following in that um, 
cubist style of reducing a natural form into simpler, more geometric shapes, and that's a tree. He actually did trees many times, and you can track his um, progress into complete abstraction by looking at trees. But um, I'm just cutting to the chase here and showing you an early tree and then where he ends up um, with just these simple forms of straight lines and white and black and red, yellow, blue. So he has determined at, at the maturity of his style and his career that that is the simplest and the most beautiful. By um, putting this idea in red, this means that it's going to be on the quiz, he really thought that the power of these pieces, like uh, this composition with yellow, red, and blue, he thought that people could look at this and it would really alter their brain, that it would change the way you think. It would bring you peace and harmony uh, because there was nothing, there's no conflict, there's no tension, there's just this stability and perfect calmness in this. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. His approach was similar to that of Leger. I mean, both of these guys um, think that their paintings can change the world for the better. Um, very interesting. So this is, this, the style was called Die Style, which just literally means the style. He's the main exponent of this, the main person who works in Die Style. Um, but he does have some influence, as we're going to see in a minute. So he was influenced by Cubism. He moved gradually into more abstract forms. A composition with yellow, red, and blue shows his restriction of formal vocabulary to the primary colors and neutrals. He called it dynamic equilibrium, and it introduced a universal style with applications beyond art. So architect and designer Gerrit Rietveld created the Schroeder House in Utrecht with the modern movement known as the international style. Dynamic equilibrium was applied to the entire house, and that was that technique that, um, that Mondrian pioneered dynamic equilibrium. Uh, the famous, let's see, this is the exterior. So um, I always want you to try to understand the context of these. So this was made in 1925. This was like a normal house at the time. Uh, 1925 is also the Roaring Twenties in America. This is when flappers um, and raccoon coats and all that stuff was in style. So this would have been extremely radical. It would have stuck out like a sore thumb. This is the interior of the house. Um, the famous red-blue chair in the bedroom is shown in this partitioned bedroom. So everything in the house was uh, designed according to this dynamic equilibrium. There's the chair uh, and the bed in the background. It just looks so cozy. Oh, no. So, Expressionism, Cubism, Futurism, Dada, De Style. You're keeping these all separate, right? So let's look at the international style of architecture, which uh, Rietveld was working in. So, Purism believed in the power of art to change the world. Um, Le Corbusier, whose real name was charles Édouard Gemeret, uh, was the leading purist figure. Ville Savoie is an icon of the international style with domino construction. It incorporated curtain walls and ribbon windows on the exterior. So this is a, a ribbon window, this long window form that goes across there. Um, the rooms are upstairs somewhere. I think there are rooms down here. I've never visited this house, so I don't know exactly... Uh, how it works. But there it is, 1929. So this is the, the year of the stock market crash. Um, the, the world is thrust into the Great Depression, especially America. Um, and this time I actually have a photograph to show you how, um, how unusual this form was. This is a car from the same year that the house was built. 
so you can see it it has a a distinct style that is uh, new so this euro style here they call it the international style at the time international style so continuing with international style um the germans really pick up on this um they um they develop um, a system and a workshop and later a school called the Bauhaus. So the Bauhaus brought together artists and designers working in the new international style. The learning was rooted in doing but evolved into a school. Designers created sleek functional design suitable for mass production. So sleek and functional was sort of sort of the bywords of Bauhaus and here's a tea service that is in a sleek and function all of this would have been very radically new design style it really leads to the aesthetic that you see in Ikea today so this sort of um, sleek and functional design so here's the buildings of Bauhaus um, designed by Walter Gropius um, designed the building when the Bauhaus moved to the city of Dessau. So again, difficult to communicate to you how radically new and modern this would have looked at the time, but seriously, in the 1920s. Because um, it, I mean, it looks like the kind of stuff that looks like our old uh, suburban buildings here. But um, the technology advances meant that there was no need for walls as structural support. So uh, so Gropius replaced them with glass panels on some sides of the structure is really um, from the inner part of the building is um, what holds it up. So this was, like I said, it was a workshop. There were designers designing professionally, but then it became a school where many future designers and artists were uh, trained by by um, pedagogic that is still practiced today in many art schools, including our art department here. But Adolf Hitler didn't like this. He forced the closure of the Bauhaus in 1933. The Nazis attacked modernist painters. Oh, I think I've got a couple of slides that we can look at here. Um, yeah. So, um, Nazis attacked modernist painters whose intense depiction of German soldiers were considered unpatriotic. To them, the art was not a matter of taste, but a very dangerous to the psyche and had to be destroyed. Tolerance was not an option. The suppression of the avant-garde in Germany. A principal target was the Bauhaus School of Art and Design. Uh, after Adolf Hitler came to power, the Bauhaus was forced to close for good. Nazis attacked told you that. Um, Nazi leadership then organized an exhibit called Degenerate Art and it was intended to erase banned modern works. So they wanted to show the public how awful this stuff was so that everybody would become haters. Um, by the time World War II began, German authorities burned countless subversive works from throughout the country. So here's another example of iconoclasm. This time it's politically motivated. Many German artists then fled the country um, at this time. Many coming to the USA and in fact um, many came to North Carolina to um, teach. So this is one of the rooms from the Degenerate Art Exhibit in, in Antarctic Kunst um, from 1937. And it was uh, an exhibit, like I said, it was mounted by the Nazis, and they wanted to show the public how horrible modern art was. Here's a Kandinsky painting up here. Um, there are works by artists that I've already shown you on the walls here and some more that I will show you. Um, and their response was not to tolerate it, but to uh, turn the public into haters and to s destroy it because it was they thought it was dangerous to the psyche, to the brains, that um, it was very unhealthy. 
But um, the exhibit was wildly popular, and, and the consensus of historians is that it, instead of turning the people into haters, it turned them into fans. So um, I don't know. It's an interesting topic for sure. Um, surrealism is our next um, ism that we're going to look at. So it is, there are two anti-rationalist reactions to World War I. And we've already seen the first, that was Dada, uh, where they basically say, no, there's no point in, you know, being controlled and being logical or thoughtful or intellectual at all. And the other is surrealism, and it's um, got an entirely different goal. Um, which I hope to communicate to you. I'm sure you, you have marginal familiarity with surrealism, but I hope that you're going to uh, see a deeper meaning to it. So surrealism was founded by André Breton, and it sought to free the human behavior from constructions like reason and morality. Techniques to aid the endeavor included dream analysis, free association, automatic writing, and word games. So, um, excuse me if I repeat myself, but um, I really like to... Uh, attempt to communicate this. So their goal was to help people discover a more intense reality that lay beyond a rational constraint. So the idea is that all of us sort of function in this normal material world and we deal with material reality um, day to day. And their idea was that there is something beyond that, that there's a metaphysical world uh, or a spiritual world or something greater. And they called it the super real, like we live in the real, but they thought there was a super real. And so um, they created art and their goal was that the art would jar you, would like shake you up or shock you into breaking free of the constraints of the real world so that you could then be aware of the super real world. Um, and various artists have different... Um, methods of attempting that shock value. So um, Salvador Dali, as you can see here, makes unreal things appear really real. So he paints these sort of fantastic um, images very naturalistically. So he doesn't shade them arbitrarily. He shades them naturalistically. These forms, look at this soft piano. So everything looks real, and as the viewer looks at these and attempts to read or understand the picture, it would suddenly hit you that, wait a minute, this is not real, and you would be shocked out of your little complacent life into this greater awareness. Um, that's his goal. His goal is not just to be freaky. It's not just to give uh, people who are stoned on drugs, you know, a real thrill. It, no, it is to shake you into a higher awareness. So here's his most famous painting, The Persistence of Memory. Um, and you can see his shading of objects, painting them as though they're real. That shape that is in the center, um, sort of resembles bone, it sort of resembles skin. We don't quite understand it, but we can see drooping clocks. All of that is just like um, wrong. So um, Salvador Dali contributed the paranoid critical method, it's called. In the persistence of memory, it shows a metaphysical world where time has ended and he placed limp timepieces in a realistic view of the Bay of Rosas. The lower left ants feeding on a metallic watch was inspired by childhood memories of seeing dead animals swarming with ants. So this was um, Salvador Dali style. But here's another surrealist. And see, this is why if you just think somebody paints unnatural or unreal things realistically. That's just one approach. That's one approach to shock people. So Merritt Oppenheim here um, created a 
a, um, I'd say, I said, produce a disquieting assemblage. Um, it's the incongruity, this juxtaposition of texture on something that the texture doesn't belong. So putting fur on um, this spoon and cup with, is intended to shock you, to shock the viewers. And I know um, the first time I saw it, I just had a visceral response imagining what it would be like to stick a furry spoon in my mouth. And it's not pleasant, but I... I don't think I experienced heightened awareness after that, uh, but I could have. Anyway, that's another surrealist. And here's another surrealist. This is Joan Miro. Um, in contrast, silhouette shapes against the hazy background here in composition. The biomorphic curves evoke organic forms with fluctuating identities. The composition, abstracted arrangement, very precisely planned and executed, but suggest automatic writing. So automatic writing is was one of the um, surrealistic techniques where uh, an artist would hold a pencil or a paintbrush or something, but not consciously attempt to control it. So they believed that something from this higher realm would actually move the pencil or pen um, and create the artwork. That's called automatic writing. And um, I don't need to tell you that there's a lot of people who are interested in um, like the occult who would think that spirits from the beyond could communicate via automatic writing. So there's a connection there. And now we've reached the end of, um, of chapter 19, part 2, and I will uh, continue this in part 3, so stay tuned.